conference at this beautiful location, which uh, when it is sunny might divert people from attending the conference, but uh, what they miss out um, is of course high quality research, thoughts, ideas, discussions, um, and that is what we are standing for in this panel. Yeah. Yes. I have to announce that Ralf Band Herden, who is on the printed program, uh, cannot attend today. Uh, instead, uh, we will have Reinhard Magner talking about Adam Weishaupt um, later on. And those of you who were present at the presentation of the uh, Illuminati ritual uh, book uh, are well aware of uh, what Reinhardt uh, has been doing in his research about the Illuminati. And he will talk about that um, as the second speaker. And the third speaker is myself, so, uh, which uh, secures me from being criticized by the chair of this panel. So this is the work that you, the other guys will have to do for, for me. <laughs> So, without further ado, I would like to introduce Mike Hersley, who is uh, the... I'm going to tell him. Uh, he's going to tell you what he is, because he is something. He is, <laughs> he is something, and that's really great. So, without further ado, I, I um, leave the word to um, uh, Mike Hersley, who's going to present um, uh, David H. Lewis' paper on Freemasonry under the Nazis. Thank Please. You. Thank you. Is this coming through? No. Is that coming through? No. Is it on? Strange. Is it this is on. Is it on on switch? How's that? Is that? Okay. How's that? Jolly good. Yes, I am not David Lewis. Uh, David Lewis lives in South Africa. He's not well. He's been told he hasn't to fly. So he contacted me and said, I'm not going to be able to meet up with you and I'm not going to be able to deliver my paper. I know David very well. I'm the editor of the Square magazine. And his paper is the lead article in the next issue, which is coming out in about a week's time. So I said, <laughs> so I said, David, if you're happy, I will be very happy to present it for you. I might have to edit it a little bit. And I've brought some copies of the Square magazine here. If you'd like to have one before you leave, you better be quick. Now, Freemasonry under the Nazis. Let me just get my little thing here. Right. In uh, 1919, a retired army officer, uh, Müller von Hausen, with a few other people, attacked Weltfreimaurer, meaning International Freemasonry, and he alleged it was dominated by Jews. And they maintained that Jews and Freemasons were responsible for Germany's defeat in 1918. Now, the Treaty of Versailles, we know, was rather harsh to Germany, and it caused a lot of resentment. The Kaiser, deposed Kaiser Wilhelm, who was living quietly now in Holland, stated that his throne had been stolen by Jews and by Freemasons. And of course, this conspiracy theory provided a very easy explanation for Germany's defeat. Masonic lodges in Germany at that time comprised the middle class intellectuals, senior civil servants, judges, magistrates, accountants, doctors, wealthy merchants, university professors, bankers, and the aristocracy. Very similar to England, where, we, of course, we had the king and royal princes. It was considered to be very advantageous socially and uh, for a person to be a member of Freemasonry and, of course, for their social and professional standing. Now, in his only reference to masonry in Mein Kampf, written in eight, uh, 1924, Hitler said that Freemasonry had succumbed to the Jews and it had become an excellent instrument for their, the Jews, aims. He also said, ourselves, or the Freemasons, or the church, there is room for one of the three and no more. And as we are the strongest of the three, we shall get rid of the other two. He also said, that uh, Germany's participation in the League of Nations had delivered Germany to the Freemasons. Of course, when the Nazis came to power, they were able then to loot, invade, desecrate lodges all around the country. In Berlin, for example, uh, in a brown shirt parade, Masons were hauled through the streets in a cage, just like animals. Many lodges, of course, had substantial inventories of property and rather large bank accounts. Some of their buildings were very grand, 
and in Mecklenburg, Schlesen, Königsberg, Schleswig-Holstein, and so on, the police occupied these buildings because they said they wanted to protect them against excesses. In one lodge, for example, a portrait of Hitler hung between those of Kaiser Wilhelm I and King Friedrich II, both of whom were portrayed in full Masonic regalia. The members, when they returned, found that the Kaiser's portraits had been turned to the wall, and there was a note saying, beware of bringing our Fuhrer between two Freemasons again. The two portraits subsequently disappeared. Another incident with a portrait occurred when the Grand Master of Lodge Munster presented a portrait of Field Marshal Blücher to General Bloomberg, who was a strong supporter of the Nazis, for his 40th birthday. Now, Blücher was shown in that portrait in full Masonic regalia. Later, the regalia was actually painted out of the painting. Estimates of the value of the property looted from German lodges varies between 45 and 200 million Reichsmarks. Some of the furniture was given to party members for their personal use, such as Göring, and others were sold by public auction. Silverware was melted down and Masonic items sent to Goebbels' Living Museum of Freemasonry. These were situated in places such as Nuremberg, Hanover, Berlin, Dusseldorf, England and several other cities. They were open to the public, indeed the public were encouraged to visit them, so that they could all see what terrible people these Freemasons actually were. In 1934, Dr. Wilhelm Frick, the Minister of the Interior, said, it is inappropriate that a secret society with obscure aims should continue to exist in the Third Reich. It is high time that the Freemasons' lodges should disappear in Germany as they have in Italy. If this is not realized in Masonic circles, I will soon help them in this direction. In May 1935, there was indeed an order rendering all Freemasons ineligible for public service or service in the Wehrmacht and the army. Now, a controversy exists concerning the role of Freemasonry and Freemasons in general during the Nazi regime. In questioning the actions of German Freemasons in the 1930s, it is clear that they were both victims and collaborators amongst them. Elick Howe, brother Elick Howe, wrote a paper, The Collapse of Freemasonry in Nazi Germany, 1933-1935. And he deals with this aspect quite fully. He reports that a certain Dr. Otto Bordes claimed in a letter to Nazi party headquarters that the majority of the order's members were in complete sympathy with the aims of the party. Richard Bross, Grand Master of the Grand Lodge in Hamburg, said, we support our Reich Chancellor Adolf Hitler and sent a personal letter to Adolf Hitler applauding his efforts, noting in that letter, we have not and never will admit Jews into our order. Well, whatever their individual view, the brethren were certainly under great pressure and undoubtedly many of them must have been quite frightened. But it must be said that a number of them certainly acted in a manner directly contrary to Masonic principles. In 1940, the SS published a black book, the Sonderfahndungslist GB, JB. This was a list of prominent figures, institutions, and organizations to be arrested or to be occupied after a successful Nazi invasion of Britain. Several Masons, Masonic bodies, and lodges were listed in this book, and it must be remembered that there were indeed a number of prominent fascist supporters and appeasers of Germany in Britain at the time, led by a group of people called the Cliveden Set, which met at the home of Nancy Lady Astor. This set included many senior politicians, influential business executives, newspaper editors, including William Joyce, who later became the infamous Lord Haw Haw, 
Geoffrey Dawson, who was the editor of The Times, Montague Norman, who was the governor of the Bank of England, and so on. They were allied with the Anglo-German Fellowship, who were all pro-Nazi and violently anti-Semitic. Prominent in this group, of course, was the very famous Oswald Mosley, who was the British, the leader of the British Union of Fascists. Mosley was actually married in Goebbels's home with Hitler present to a certain Diana Mitford, who was reported as the most hated woman in England at the time. Well, she and her fascist sisters were very well known and were known to be ardent sympathizers to the Nazis and to Hitler. It's interesting too that it is said that the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, who had been Edward VII, were also ardent supporters of Hitler and indeed were waiting to be the puppet king and queen when the country was occupied. In 1940, the Germans invaded Jersey and other Channel Islands. It's actually the only British territory which was occupied by them. All meetings, of course, were suspended by arrangement with the Germans, and as agreed with them, everything was left in place provided the building was locked up. However, predictably, the Nazis betrayed this, sent in SS wreckers from Berlin, the temple was sacked, the uh, property was confiscated, and everything was shipped to Berlin, including their very valuable library. Specially trained Gestapo agents systematically destroyed and made a bonfire of everything that was left. The main temple was in fact converted into a wine store, I think you can see part of it there, and the island of Guernsey and Alderney were also treated similarly, and indeed the Alderney Temple was converted into a forced labour camp, and it became the hall for that. In 1933, the Grand Lodge in Vienna was plundered by a mob, destroying all its archives. The Grand Master, Richard Schlesinger, that we've heard about earlier today, was arrested, died shortly as a result of brutal treatment. 90% of the Masons, including the masters of the various Vienna lodges, were either shot or sent to Dachau concentration camp. Hundreds of Freemasons were sent to concentration camps and many died there. All the lodges were looted and closed. In 1919, Bela Kun had taken power in Hungary. All Masonic lodges were vandalized and closed and their contents confiscated. In 1920, a decree outlawed Freemasonry in Hungary, and this continued under the Nazis and later the Communists. They described the lodges as meeting places of the enemies of the People's Democratic Republic, of capitalist elements, and of the adherents of Western imperialism. In 1923, Mussolini declared that fascists, who were also Freemasons, must decide between the two. Rather interesting that as a young man, he had twice applied to join the Freemasons and twice he'd been rejected. There followed a period of violence against Masons and destruction of their property. The Grand Orient continued until 1925, but persecution increased and some leading Masons were assassinated. In 1926, the government appropriated the Grand Orient building, which had already been looted. Black shirt, strong arm gangs looted the homes of Masons in Milan, Florence, and other cities, and many were murdered. The Grand Master of the Grand Orient, Domizio Torrigiani, who protested against the violence, was tried in a secret court, exiled to the Lipari Islands, and starved to death. In 1940, Giovanni Preziosi was appointed by Mussolini as Inspector General of Race. He asserted that Italy was in the hands of Freemasons acting for the Jews, despite the fact that there were probably no more Freemasons or Jews in Italy by this stage. When France was invaded in 1940, the Germans confiscated Masonic property, looted lodge funds, imprisoned many Masons, and shot a large number of others. They confiscated the Grand Orient's extensive Masonic library 
and they took it to Berlin, where allegedly it was burned. When Marshal Pétain took power in the puppet Vichy government in France, he was regarded by many of the French as un capitulard, a person who prefers capitulation, giving in, rather than resistance. Pétain issued a decree suppressing secret societies. It was virulently anti-Masonic and, of course, anti-Semitic. The chairman of the Service for Secret Societies, a certain Bernard Fay, was a fervent supporter and an active collaborator with the Germans. Pitan wrote to him, telling him that Freemasonry is chiefly responsible for our misfortune and the Freemasons are worse than the Jews. Fay caused the arrest and deportation of about a thousand Freemasons and the death of at least another thousand. An interesting side issue here was the participation of the United States Ambassador to the United Kingdom, a certain Joseph Kennedy, whose son John, of course, was to become president. He was a strong Nazi supporter and agreed to meet Goering in Vichy. He donated considerable amounts of money to the German cause, as did a certain Thomas J. Watson, who was the founder and head of IBM, which was indeed a German company, the Hollerith Tabulating Company, with the funds and profits being sent back to Germany. Thomas J. Watson was awarded the highest civilian award personally by Adolf Hitler in Berlin in early 1939. Many Freemasons were active, of course, in the resistance to all of this, and of the 50,000 Freemasons in France, 6,000 were arrested, about 1,000 sent to concentration camps, and over 500 executed or died in other German camps. In 1940, after the German invasion of Holland, Masonic buildings, archives, and funds were confiscated. Other Masonic items were either destroyed or sold at auction. The Grand Master, Hermanus von Tongeren, was arrested and kept for six months in an Amsterdam jail before being sent to Sachsenhausen concentration camp, where he died in 1941. Now, in 1939, there were about 4,000 Masons in Belgium, and many were imprisoned and died in, in German camps. The Nazis closed all of the lodges, of course, and one of the officials of the SS assigned to deal with Freemasonry actually wrote and apologized to his superior officer for delaying action against the Jews because, he said, all his efforts were concentrating, uh, concentrated on fighting the Freemasons. When Norway was invaded in 1940, the Masonic Temple in Oslo was converted to an army barrack and the order dissolved. Major Wittgen Quisling, the Nazi collaborator, had Freemasonry as point number one for action on his agenda and emptied Masonic buildings and destroyed some of them. Masons were murdered, and when Quisling was tried after the war, his trial, ironically, took place in a former Masonic temple where he was convicted and shot. In Romania, Bulgaria, Denmark, Poland, the puppet government prohibited Freemasonry and carried out suppression, confiscation, imprisonment, and execution of Masons. In Yugoslavia, when the war broke out, Masonry was dissolved by decree and its property confiscated, its members dismissed from public service, and many imprisoned. In Czechoslovakia, there were two Grand Lodges, one of which was largely Jewish, German-speaking, about 5,000 members, and the other, Czech-speaking, about 500 members. When the Germans invaded, they produced a list of three to 4,000 alleged Freemasons, many of whom were arrested and sent to camps. In Greece, all Masonic lodges were closed, archives destroyed, and many Masons shot. The chief rabbi of Salonika, Zvi Koretz, was imprisoned for a year, not because he was Jewish, but because he was accused of being involved in a Masonic conspiracy. In Portugal, Salazar suppressed Freemasonry in 1931 and lodge doors were sealed. 
In Spain, unbridled butchery occurred. Franco was a fascist and completely in league with the Nazis, but avoided becoming directly involved in the war. He was, however, virulently anti-Masonic. He wrote a number of articles said to be about 50 under an assumed name, depicting Freemasonry in the worst possible terms. Following his military coup in 1936, many Freemasons were arrested and executed. Death squads ran rampant in every town in Spain, and although there were only about 5,000 Masons in Spain, they managed to produce a list of 80,000 suspected Masons. The result was horrific. Simple accusation was enough for torture, imprisonment, and execution. The slightest suspicion of being a Mason resulted in a firing squad, or if you were lucky, a long term in prison. In 1938, Hitler's publishing house issued Freemasonry, its worldview and organization and policies. It was written by a certain Dieter Schwarz with a preface by no less than Reinhard Heydrich who was second in command, you will recall, of the Gestapo. Heydrich wrote, Masonic lodges are associations of men who closely bound together in a union employing symbolical usages represent a supranational spiritual movement, the idea of humanity, a general association of mankind without distinction of race, religion, or social and political conviction. This was written by a vicious enemy of Freemason, and it is in fact a very graphic and accurate description of the purpose, value, and importance of Freemasonry in the world. Isn't it ironic and almost unbelievable that it could be written by one of these evil thugs? Well, this is not a happy story for Freemasonry, and it could be much longer. The result of these persecutions, understandably, was that Freemasonry went underground. Records were destroyed, members' details were destroyed. You must not discuss Freemasonry, even with your family, at a time when children are perhaps being encouraged to inform on their parents at school and so on. The result was that many of the public came to believe that the accusations being made against Freemasons were probably true. And these lies have continued to the present. Now, of course, reinforced, as you can see here, by internet sites and various exposures. The, public, the publication of critical exposures in the 1980s the Brotherhood, inside the Brotherhood, and so on. Coupled with the Roberta Calvi affair in Italy and London, simply reinforced all of these accusations in people's minds. Now today, English Freemasonry is seeking to be more open to the public and to be able to present what it is and what it does. However, some would say the damage has already been done. In the years since the Second World War, the craft in England has virtually lost its royal connection. It has lost the involvement of most of the churches, some of which are openly, in fact all of the churches, some of which are openly antagonistic. It has lost the professional, military, political leaders. It has lost most of the middle class. It has tried to replace declining membership through initiatives which many now consider to be dumbing down. We are being told by United Grand Lodge of England that Freemasonry is nothing more than a social club that people of any age or background can join. Well, none of these initiatives seem to be making much difference overall. So some are saying the Nazis actually won, and it's too late. But it's for you to decide whether you agree. Thank you very much.
Thank you very, thank you very much, uh, Mike Kearsley, for this presentation. Excellently read. I know how difficult it is to read somebody else's paper, but you did that excellently, I think. Uh, we will, uh, as usual, spare the questions for our question time at the end of the session. And without further delay, uh, I will um, uh, pass uh, the word to Reinhard Markner, who is then uh, who is replacing uh, Ralph Bernd Herden's talk on the Grand Duchy of Baden, and said, "Give us a bit more uh, uh, information about the uh, Order of Weishaupt and the Illuminati." I just have to figure out how I will get this up and running here. Chupidu. Uh, here we go. There it is. Uh huh. But nothing happens yet. Yeah, that's right. Oh, here we there go. Yeah. yeah. Okay, please, Reinhardt. Yes, uh, thank you, Andreas. Um, as Andreas has already explained, I was initially scheduled to talk on another panel to get together with my colleague and friend Joe Wages, uh, who is also present here. Um, it was meant to be uh, kind of a double feature, uh, presenting our recently published book, The Secret so um, School of Wisdom. Um, and that's why I've only prepared a very short uh, contribution, highlighting a small yet significant detail in the degree system of the Illuminati order. Much of the enduring notoriety of the Illuminati order can be traced back, sorry, <clears throat> reading from the screen can be tricky. Much of the enduring notoriety of the Illuminati order can be traced back to the fact that it was probably the first secret society ever to be comp comprehensively exposed by the publication of its rituals as well as correspondence between its leading members. At the time, in 1787, the reading public in Germany was both thrilled and appalled by these insights into dealings that were meant to be forever hidden from the uninitiated. Little did the contemporary observers realize, however, how much was still being obscured from their view. It is only now, after more than two centuries have passed, and despite the loss of many precious documents, that a fuller picture of the order's inner workings is emerging. What we present in the recently published book, The Secret, um, the Secret School of Wisdom, is a full manual of all the rituals, catechisms, and constitutions that made up the degree system of the Illuminati as devised by Adam Weishaupt, whom you can see in the picture, and his close collaborator, Adolf von Knigge, from 1777 to 1783. By following the series of documents collected in the book, the reader is able to trace a path akin to that of a career in the order, progressing from one stage to the next, ascending through the levels of knowledge and secrecy, and finally reaching those degrees which were meant only for the, for the chosen few. The most basic degree of the Illuminati Sorry, that, uh, that's the um, that's the book on the uh, that's the newly published book, and that's the uh, Originalschriften uh, published by the Bavarian government um, in 1787 uh, in order to vindicate their actions against this uh, secret society. The most basic degree of the Illuminati was called the Minerva degree, and that name alluded to the role of Pallas Athene. Minerva in the Roman tradition as a patron of knowledge and the arts. You can see a Minerva statue here in front of a Rome University. When first considering the design of a signet, Weisart was thinking of a flying tawny owl before a starred sky together with the motto quantum est quod nescimus, how much it is that we do not know. It would seem that the idea of using a little owl sitting on the pages of an open book as the sign of the new degree was instead inspired by a page in one of the most famous Baroque collection of emblems, Nucleus Emblematum Selectissimorum, published in 1611. Etched by the Dutch artist and publisher Crispine de Pass, 
The Pictura was accompanied by a distich by the German author Gabriel Rollenhagen that might be translated as he who, ca he who carefully studies the words of the wise is deservedly considered a learned man. The way the superior, in a passage of the degree where he addresses the candidate, talks of nightly reflections for which the owl is a symbol, may have, meant, may have been meant as a pun on the etymology of vigi vigilance in the motto Studio et Vigilancia. Towards the end of the in initiation into that degree, the Minerva degree, the candidate has shown two carpets with mysterious images for which he will be given an explanation only if he progresses further. I won't elaborate on the Egyptian pyramid here, apart from pointing out that at the time a German translation of Terrasson's novel Setoth had just been published with the pyramid on its title page, which may or may not have been Weishaupt's source of inspiration. The other image is much more mysterious, but its source can be traced back to a strange little book called Krata Ripoa. This book was written in 1770 by two leading members of the so-called African Builders, a short-lived paramazonic society in Berlin. The book describes supposedly ancient Egyptian mysteries. The fourth degree, called Battle of the Shadows, sees the adept who wishes to advance further and become a Kistophoris, being attacked and captured by masked men wielding torches and snakes. When his blindfold is removed, he finds himself in a resplendent hall in the presence of the king and his demiurge. An orator praises him for his resolve, but warns him of the further probes ahead. He is then ordered to down a bitter drink and hand, he is handed the shield of Minerva, the boots of Anubis, the coat and cap of Orcus, and a sword. Once clad and armed in this way, he does as he is told and decapitates the first person he encounters in the cave of the enemy, which happens to be the artificial body of a beautiful woman. The king's demiurge applauds this deed and explains to him that he has brought the gorgon's head. He is subsequently awarded various privileges and decorated with a medal depicting Isis or Minerva in the shape of an owl. It is explained to him that man at birth was as blind as an owl, but became a man through probes and philosophy. He is told that the helmet signifies the highest degree of wisdom, the gorgon's head the suppression of passions, the shield the protection from slanderous talk, the pillar steadfastness, the water jug, the thirst for knowledge, the quiver with the arrow's eloquence, the spear, persuasion from afar, and the palm and olive branch, whatever that means, peace. So that's the whole explanation of this picture here. This interpretation foreshadowed the one given at the end of the Illuminati's minor degree. The footnotes in the book Krata Ripoa lead the reader to an illustrated depiction of a chimerical, a chimerical Minerva in an opulent catalogue of Roman antiquities entitled Le Grand Cabinet Romain, published in 1706 as a translation of the earlier Latin edition, and, is, and it is obvious from the illustrations to the Minerva degree that Weishaupt followed that lead. The author of those works, Michel-Ange de la Chausse, a French banker and consul in Rome, presented the engraved, engraved gem from his collection as a talisman carved of heliotrope. That's the uh, picture from the catalogue. A uh, carved of heliotrope, uh, a red stone. La Chausse, who died in 1724, bequeathed at least parts of his collection which also included a large number of antique coins, to the French convent Trinité de Mont, overlooking the Spanish steppes in Rome. There, however, 
His treasures fell victim to misappropriation and neglect even before the troops of revolutionary France devastated Rome in 1798. Fortunately, though, an impression of the engraved gem in question was made by the German diplomat and spy Philip von Stosch and later acquired by the Scottish engraver James Tassie, copies of whose collection of impressions are kept in Edinburgh at the National Portrait Gallery, in London at the Victoria and Albert Museum, and in St. Petersburg at the Hermitage. Even though the fate of the original engraved gem is unknown, it can be said on the basis of, exi of the existing reproductions that Lachaud's de description of the piece and thus the foundation of both the interpretation in Crata Ripoa and in the Illuminatus Minor degree was actually mistaken. The chimera has the body not of an owl, but that of an eagle. On the other hand, Lachaud's had correctly identified the branch in its talons as that of an olive tree, where it whereas it is uh, confusingly called a palm and an olive branch in Crater Ripoa, and finally a palm branch simple by Weishaupt. Thus, the secret that was being entrusted to the members of the Illuminati order was actually based on an obscure book written by leading figures of, anoth of another secret society, which by then was extinct. Weishaupt lifted it from that book in a rather randomly fashion and it turns out that the iconographic interpretation itself, which he offered to the members, was corrupted as a result of this complicated transmission. It would seem that this was the price to be paid for making up a mystery. Thank you. Thank you so much. <coughs> Thank you so much for this uh, very nice illustration of uh, the um, uh, visual world of the Illuminati, um, which also is an interesting case because there are so many misconceptions around it. But uh, thanks a lot for this uh, deep investigation into uh, the uh, symbolism of the Illuminati order. Now I will have to switch to my own presentation here somehow. I will manage it, maybe. Let's see here. Here we go. Right. Maybe if I press here. There it is. Oh, no. Here we go. Right. Um, my presentation is titled Unveiling the Copiale Manuscript, Layers of Fraternalism, Ritual and Politics in 18th Century Germany. Um, I'm a reader on the history of sciences and ideas at Gothenburg University, Sweden. And uh, this manuscript has uh, been following me for a couple of years now. In 2011, uh, data linguists from Sweden and uh, uh, the U United States decoded a manuscript written in cipher, the content of which has been unknown for at least uh, the last two centuries. This so-called Copiale manuscript, it is called Copiale, by the way, because the only readable piece of text that is in the manuscript is, is a word written Copiale. Um, and once you title a manuscript with a, a title, then, then it is there. So we co let's call it Copiale manuscript. One could call it the Oculist manuscript as well. This so-called Copiale manuscript and the story of its code being broken with methods of new information technology received transnational media coverage. But its content remains, remains still to be explored thoroughly. The manuscript can roughly be divided into uh, three parts. Uh, one part is devoted to the fraternal order of oculists, the aim of which is to disclose the secrets of Freemasonry and to undermine its spread and recruitment. A second part reveals um, rituals of craft lodges as practiced in Germany at the time. And the third part, the Scottish master's degree, one of the first higher degrees um, uh, 
in Freemasonry with both a chivalric and a sacerdotal element. Furthermore intriguing is a continuation of the Scottish master's degree that uh, clearly um, points at a an, an, uh, political content, um, demonstrates awareness of civil and political rights and the need to recover freedom from tyranny by means of violent uh, rebellion. Last but not least, alchemical workings uh, are also addressed. What are the sources of the manuscript? Does it describe German early 18th century Freemasonry accurately? Why do we find an anti-Masonic edge? Now, how can we interpret the religious and political motives of the higher degrees exposed? All in all, by addressing these questions, it appears as if the Copiale manuscript is like a Russian doll and plays with secrecy and transparency. It reveals significant insights into the state of fraternalism, rich and politics in German territories of the late 1740s um, that beg further investigation. Um, first, I would like to present some facts about the Copiale manuscript. It contains 105 pages. The original uh, manuscript is bound in a booklet that is preserved in Uppsala, Sweden. Uh, it is the personal ownership of one of the data languages that uh, decoded it. She received it as a present from a friend. Um, it is what um, steganographists call a multiple substitution cipher. I will show uh, later what it, that means. It is also a cipher with logograms so with pictures and images uh, that are replacing uh, words or um, uh, uh, alphabet and other elements of coding, for instance, blank spaces. It was deciphered in 2011 by a group of Swedish American data linguists from Uppsala and uh, the University of South California in Los Angeles. Um, I was asked immediately by my colleagues in Uppsala if I didn't want to have a look at the document, which I did. And uh, thanks to uh, the very effective public relation work of uh, the University of Southern California, uh, that made a little um, interview about the project. Uh, the, the New York Times wrote an article, and then the uh, international media snowballing uh, 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 was running over us in, in, the, in the autumn of 2011, which was a very ex interesting experience. <clears throat> Well, this is an, an image of um, uh, the, the hard work of deciphering the code. I'm not a code expert, so I, I will not be able to tell you or answer any questions about the deciphering work. But here you can see what the, uh, the problem is. You have seen the manuscript page, and uh, as you can see, some of the letters are um, replaced with different ciphers. Uh, we have also uh, letters that, uh, ordinary letters that represent space, as you can see. There is a certain sign for, uh, for repeat and for uh, typical um, uh, combinations of letters in German language. And we have the logograms. And the, the tricky thing with the logograms is that when you start to read the document, you, you will understand that they can have double or multiple meanings. Yes, and uh, um, as it should be these days, the entire project is well documented and there is a homepage with articles and resources uh, online at uh, Uppsala University um, with the entire uh, scans of the entire document and with uh, automatically generated German and English translations. Uh, we are in the state of um, uh, producing a clear a German transcript for translation to English. And it, when you read this stuff online, you will understand why we need to do that with old fashioned means of uh, old, not digital scholarship. Uh, yes, if you go into the anatomy of the manuscript, it contains, as I said before, First, the description of a mixed uh, gender fraternity called the Oculist Order. Um, and that is uh, 27 pages of the, uh, the highly illuminated order of the Oculists, the Hoch Erleuchtete Oculisten Orden. 
And since the most secret intentions of the Oculus is to expose Freemasonry, pages 27 to 105 are then devoted to a thorough description of various Masonic degrees, mainstream Freemasonry, apprentice, fellow and master's degree, uh, on pages 27 to 68, the Scottish master's degree on pages 68 to 99, um, the so-called Key Lodge, apparently a deviant continuation or variety of the Scottish master's degree, highly interesting, and we'll come back to that, on pages 100 to 104, and the so-called Consolation Lodge, practicing alchemical workings on page 105. Um, if we first start with the uh, Oculist order, uh, this is its seal. Yes, additional um, source material has been preserved in Braunschweig um, that actually point at the real existence of the Oculist order. Um, Wolfenbüttel, sorry, yes, it's close, close to Braunschweig, but one should point out in Wolfenbüttel. Uh, and also my colleagues from Uppsala have been down there and secured documents that are written in, in the same cipher. Uh, that also are presented on the website of the project. Um, the Order of Oculists is designed according to a well-established pattern that it shares with many other fraternal orders and organizations of the period. Uh, the in initiation ceremony has many similarities to Freemasonry, with the candidate being introduced in the, to the lodge room by officers with designated tasks. A master of the Oculist Lodge questions the candidate, who subsequently has to that was my reminder. That was actually uh, your presentation that is over now, Reinhard, so. <laughs> so, uh, sorry, I was in the middle of the initiation uh, ceremony. Uh, the uh, candidate has to take an oath. Um, and the significant element of the uh, initiation ritual is a symbolic eye operation where optical instruments are displayed. A second oath is taken from which it emerges that there is a context of other fraternal orders the candidate potentially could be a member of. And it's striking that the order of Mopsis is uh, explicitly mentioned here, since it was a mixed gender hoax fraternity, the rituals of which had been exposed in 1745. L'ordre de et le that had been spread across Europe. The Oculus manuscript makes reference to this particular publication also later in its section about Freemasonry. After initiation follows instruction and education related to the degree, signs and tokens and behavioral rules and modes of reciprocal recognition outside the lodge are explained thoroughly. Um, in the fellow degree, the obligation is reiterated. Um, and now in the master's degree, um, begins with a renewal of those obligations and threat of expulsion. And the masterpiece is to be able to read and write the cipher of the order. During the instruction, the master is informed about the origin and secret constitutions of the order, as well as instructed in the use of the cipher. And he is also presented with a Grand Lodge certificate. Uh, we don't know exactly uh, how many uh, of these uh, potential Oculist lodges might have been existed. Um, there was a published uh, even um, a, a little booklet containing the rules and regulations of the order. Uh, so we, we have, have no idea. But the most interesting part is, is, is yet to follow. The largest part of the manuscript is the straightforward exposure of Masonic ritual in the degrees of apprentice, fellow, and master. Uh, and those of you um, having studied German Freemasonry, uh, and, and it's also in general very difficult to make a clear reference to Germany before 1871, we have to take into account the, the huge cultural variety of territories across uh, German space or European space even in the time before the unification of, of, of the empire um, was exposed to two different streams of um, uh, inspiration, so to speak. Uh, one from France and one from England, which I, in, in the full version of the paper, also explained thoroughly why, why there are things in the, in the exposure of the uh, copiale um, that point in that direction. And, and also, um, it, it is, a, it, I give you one example. What, what makes it a, a bit strange is that, uh, for instance, um, uh, the third degree sp in exposure speaks of Hiram as the architect of Solomon's temple. Um, 
whereas uh, the French ritual family stick to Adoniram, but at the same time, in, in the same exposure, the wardens are called jüngere and ältere, so junior and senior, which is similar to the English expressions, but then the French term surveillant uh, also occurs in, the, uh, occurs in the Oculist manuscript. So the wardens are called surveillants, as in the French ritual families. Uh, Hiram is called Hiram, not Adoniram. And, and the, the, um, the, um, uh, the wardens are called a junior and senior, as in the English tradition. So things are mixed. That is my main message when it comes to the exposure of Masonic ritual. Uh, if that not would be interesting enough to, to analyze more closely, uh, the centerpiece or the most interesting thing is that, that the fourth degree that comes in uh, as the next layer of the Russian doll is the Scottish master. Uh, those of you who, who are a little bit familiar of, of the development of the higher degrees know that uh, there are many prejudices about the uh, emergence of higher degrees in, in 18th century Europe and many theories. And thanks to the work of Pierre Mollier and others, uh, we have uh, established a clear date from when we can count the establishment of Scottish degrees in Europe, which is 1742. Um, but this document uh, speaks about the Scottish master as a completely new innovation, um, which then f would speak for that this is written pretty close to 1742. And then the manuscript starts to talk that, about that the Scottish masters practiced in a French lodge. Which can it refer to? Is it the L'Union in Berlin that is the 1742 lodge? Uh, it talks about the other German lodges, so there must be more of them working in that degree. Um, it's talking about explicitly Braunschweig in Berlin, but gives no names. What names are there? And then uh, the surprising thing that we, as the next layer of the exposure, find the so-called Key Lodge, uh, which obviously is a continuation of the Scottish Master's degree. So what are the motives? First, some principal uh, things about the Scottish Master. The Scottish Master is the original fourth degree um, as the Royal Arch in Britain, a narrative continuation of the third degree. The main theme here in the manuscript is the rediscovery of the lost master word in the debris of Solomon's temple. And then there's an explicit time reference for that during Christian medieval times. Approximately simultaneously another degree is developed, the maître élu or the selected master, centered around the discovery and punishment of Adoniram's Hiram's murderers. So that's another theme complex, but it's also a continuation. And this degree is later, and when I talk later, I talk about strict observance or the Swedish rite, in between the third and the original fourth degree as an intermediate motive. So the fourth degree turns into degree five or six, depending on how we count, with clear chivalric and definitely also some sacerdotal motives. So the manuscript says that in the so-called French lodge, most likely that is L'Union in Berlin, 7742, and working in French, a tracing board is described that is very similar to the one a Danish brother, Dahle, took with him to Copenhagen in 1747. And Dahle had been initiated into L'Union. He had paid a substantial amount of money to get a certificate to establish a lodge in Copenhagen. And uh, this uh, description is the one you can see here of that tracing board. And the description Copiola matches that description fairly well. The main theme here is that Hiram's identity as a priest with access to the holiest of holy is revealed. The candidate is purged with water as a Levite and is granted access. Uh, Hiram is, according to different versions of the legend, buried in the Sanctum Sanctorum. Uh, yeah, which, I, which one could talk about for hours, but in, never mind, just accept that description. It goes then on to talk about the Scottish master and, and um, in the German Scottish lodges, there are, is a fixed number of members uh, is mentioned. Previous activities, lodge officer is required, so it's some kind of past rank degree, which also again fits pretty well with uh, similarities between installed masters uh, rituals and, and this group of rituals. And the number four is central. The tracing board is somewhat different from the early description. It's more like the one that we can see here. 
that Pierre Mollier published in an article uh, this year. The initiation starts with the Levite water purification in order to get access to the holiest of the holy, and subsequently the accolade and anointment as knight with a battle sword, sword Schlachtschwert is carried out. The apron is described very similar to the one depicted uh, below, but it should read uh, up, so the one you can see here, up there. And the motto of the Scottish degree is Dulcia post amara, the sweet after the bitter. And after having, re having read through the description a couple of times, I wonder if not the Scottish master is a combined sacerdotal and chivalric degree, which would make it quite fascinating, because this sacerdotal element is something that is assumed to have been uh, introduced in, in the later families of rituals. Um, the manuscript says that the lodges in Berlin and Braunschweig work quite similarly. The tracing board uh, is, however, most in accordance to the conventional master's degree, with some elements from the French lodge. However, the temple debris has to be placed in the center. And we have yet another tracing board that has reached Copenhagen through another Danish brother from 1748. And if you look at that, that looks very much more like a traditional craft degree um, a tracing board, but then the centerpiece is the debris of the temple. And in this version here in the manuscript, we receive the most comprehensive account of how the old master's word was rediscovered. This account is in turn, in principle, in accordance with the one that Dahle brought to Copenhagen in 1747. But curiously, it appears to be a continuation of the English version of the Hieromid legend, since it talks about 15 fellow craft that are searching for Hiram, whereas in L'Ordre de Franck Masson Trahi and in the French and Swedish families of rituals, it is always nine masters that are out looking for, for Hiram slash Adoniram. And that uh, begs the question, what is the real origin of this Scottish master's degree, uh, indeed? Also here it is pretty evident that Hiram is buried in the Sanctum Sanctorum. But uh, I've got a few minutes left. What makes the Copiola manuscript so absolutely unique is the continuation of the Scottish master's degree in the so-called Key Lodge. And I, unfortunately I have no fancy picture to show you because I haven't seen such a degree described anywhere else before and seen no visual representation of it. It's called Schlüssel Loge in German. The main theme of that degree is that tyranny has taken natural liberty from man, uh, that Freemasons or the order, depending on how you read the logogram, are called to arms to regain it, to regain liberty. The tracing board displays an olive branch, a drum, Farmer, the goddess Farmer with her trumpet, calling the Freemasons, um, a three-headed monster, possibly Kerberos, and a mountain symbolizing tyranny, three snakes, maybe an elaborated or, uh, or amended Caduceus, so the one that is Hermes is carrying, standing for positive qualities, nature, righteousness, fearlessness, spears, pistols, flags, and the Masonic, which are called the Masonic coats of arms. But then the catechism, this is a political, very political content, or content that is very much related to central ideas and political philosophy. But then the, uh, uh, the, the parallels with the Scottish master's degree are obvious, and, and the catechism to this degree uh, has an interesting reference, because the question is, who is exactly is referred to in the catechism of this degree? It says, question, how were you accepted into the key lodge? Auf und angenommen, it has in German. Answer, I am born out of the body of a woman, maybe that's the womb, which is free, subjected to no one, and not placed under any human law but only following and subordinate to God himself. It's a riddle, obviously. I have one idea, but you can also think about it. And mere speculation, which you normally don't engage in, but could that be a Christocentric interpretation of Freemasonry, which is focusing on passion? And that the liberty that he's talking about is some odd mixture of religiously interpreted liberation, um, and politically. So is this some form of liberation theology? Well, as you see, it's, it's a complete mere speculation. And then 
uh, I frequently am interviewed by the media on, on um, Freemasonry and politics, and I always say I've never seen any ritual that has in instructed anybody uh, within Freemasonry to act in a certain political manner. Uh, and this is the first one where I have to, to revise that position. Um, and then also, of course, the connections between the Jacobites and, and, and uh, uh, Ecosisme uh, and is also is always something I, I don't want to speculate into. But if my assumptions are right and the rituals from the middle of the 1740s, this key lodge might hold the link in explaining to us um, why it is righteous to oppose a tyranny, which is the... the the, the Hanoverian rule in Britain, and, and w w might also explain the religious dimension of it. Um, because the Jacobite cause, in essence, also is a Catholic cause. But as I said, mere speculation, I don't like to speculate. Sometimes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, the entire... Uh, uh, manuscript uh, ends with the Lodge of Consolation, uh, which only describes alchemical workings in a lodge, a Consolations Lodge, with a separate tracing board, ceremonies and signs that are described. And the aim of that lodge is to the fixation of mercury, works currently only in Halle. We have no other information. It also would, of course, be very interesting to talk about that. This is my little summary, and then I'm done. Why did the Oculist order use the organizational form of the secret society in order to expose another secret or another secret society? Is it a Trojan horse or a false flag operation that is going on here? Or is it simply double play with secrecy and sociability as, as the, the common determinator? How do the Oculists relate to anti-Masonic societies at large? Because there were proper anti-Masonic societies at the time. Starting from the 1720s in Britain with the Gormagans to Pietist anti-Masonry, there's an, a, um, a Danish and a Northern German anti masonianske Societe, so an anti-Masonic society that is basically organized like Freemasonry, but with the purpose of combating it. And the interesting thing that is that most of the anti-Masonic societies are gender mixed, and they oppose the, the element of exclusion of the female gender. Such does also the Copiale manuscript or the Oculists. Explicitly, that is what they find unfair, is the exclusion of the female gender. When it comes to the exposure of craft degrees, it's interesting to see if they are real and based upon true accounts from German lodges at the time. But they demonstrate, uh, in that case, that German Freemasonry in the early 1740s was exposed to both English and French influences and a double stream of inspiration pointing at future divisions. Because that is a line that I would claim continues in German Freemasonry. The Scottish master degrees exposed demonstrate that non-printed exposures circulated at the time can fill in blank spots in our knowledge about the circulation of ideas within Freemasonry. And this Scottish master's degrees point at inference from both French and more surprisingly English sources. This is something that has to be substantiated and, and researched closer in the future. And the Scottish master's degrees demonstrate that the sacralization of higher degrees into a distinctly Christian character occurred before both the strict observance and the Swedish Rite, and hence probably prepared the ground for their introduction, which is then the sacerdotal and chivalric elements um, where we later on have the development to pure cap chapter degrees. The continuation of the Scottish master's degree within the Key Lodge point clearly at the circulation of political ideas within Freemasonry, if true, but at least this is one of the first tangible uh, documents where, where, where this assumption can be made. And the description of a lodge working with a chemical motives uh, lastly points at the early prevalence of hermetic ideas circulating in German Freemasonry even before the introduction of strict observance and Swedish right. Thank you very much. <laughs> right. Okay. Yes, where shall we start? Um, uh, yeah, I, th I think we can go right into this discussion. Uh, uh, so I open up the discussion for, for the floor, please. 
Anybody? Yes? Oh, Helge Bjorn is a, he, he's a, he's a powerful speaker, so he <laughs> will speak up. Aha, uh -huh, there is one, great. Here we are. I have some comments about Norway <clears throat> and the Second World War, and yeah. I'm afraid I have to tell you that uh, not one sentence of what is written here is correct. I won't go into detail, but I'll take up a topic that is not only national Norwegian, but it's a general topic. When, <coughs> when Mr. Lewis is um, saying that um, a number of Masons were murdered, not one single Norwegian Mason was murdered because he was Mason. There were, of course, Norwegian Masons, as there were Masons in all occupied Europe that died of war consequences. But a very small percentage were murdered because they were Freemasons. And that seems to be a general <coughs> tendency among modern scholars. They don't, uh, they don't establish the fact that even though uh, people were murdered, it was not because of their membership in the fraternity. Thank you. Do you want to come yeah. Thank you very much for that. The, what I love about being an editor is that I can publish things and then somebody else will come along and say, absolute rubbish, how can you print that? Today? I say, fight with him. And it's good news for the magazine. So I would like you to write in We'll, we'll make contact with David, and we'll take it up, and who knows, there might be another article in there somewhere. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. Uh, may I just briefly uh, elaborate on that? I think the most important ex uh, exception to the general rule that Helga has just uh, presented is Spain. Uh, but Spain, of course, wasn't an occupied country. And uh, by the way, Franco wasn't a fascist. Uh, he was allied to the fascists, but he wasn't a fa fascist himself. Um, in Spain, indeed, due to uh, the large role played by Freemasonry in the Republican era preceding Franco's coup, um, there was quite an hysteria uh, against Freemasonry, which was shared by Franco himself. And indeed, quite a few Freemasons in Spain were summarily executed by, um, uh, by squads, by uh, execution squads, and uh, that is a fact that I can subscribe to. But in Germany and in most of the countries occupied by Germany, um, this was a very, very rare occasion if it indeed happened at all. I don't know of any German Freemason who uh, was murdered or executed um, some of them were indeed um, sent to concentration camps, but released um, after a very short while after having been interrogated. Um, some others were sent to concentration camps because they were Jewish. That was the cause. Uh, that, that was the case in, in Austria, in particular. Uh, but Austrian Freemasonry was a, uh, was a completely different uh, kind of Freemasonry. Uh, German Freemasonry was largely. Um, conservative, monarchistic in outlook, and Austrian Freemasonry was dominated by Jewish elements. So um, we have to distinguish between uh, what, what what happened in in various countries, and we have to carefully uh, check the facts. And I'm afraid I, I can only um, um, I, I have come to the same conclusion as Helge. Uh, that this uh, paper should be uh, criticized uh, rather heavily. <laughs> it's uh, unfortunate, of course, that the author himself isn't exactly. present. Um, but in any case, uh, it is, of course, a very important topic, and we should further explore it and uh, rectify any uh, mistakes that have been made and are being made. Sure. My, uh, my huge concern here, of course, is that in 
in editing anything that people send to you, you, you change the context and that you put words into their mouths or you take things out. I don't think I've done that. I think that uh, David is getting a kicking, as we would say, and he probably deserves it. Um, the question is why? Is, has he got his facts wrong, uh, his interpretation wrong, or has he just been lazy in, in what he's written? But I think the audience, those of you who are not professional historians, are getting a hint of the savaging that professional historians can inflict on each other, and quite right too. Thank you very much. That's an uh, interesting meta discussion here about scholarship. Uh, but um, uh, more questions to the papers, please. Come forward. Um, my colleagues before mentioned almost everything. I also have to criticize this paper. I'm very sorry for that from the Austrian point of view. Uh, first of all, it's the numbers. Uh, we know there were about 100 Freemasons that were murdered in the concentration camps. but. Like you mentioned before, they were not hunted and murdered because they were Freemasons, but because they were Jews or political left-wingers, in, in enemies of the, of the German Reich, so to say. And uh, there were about 600 who could escape uh, to, well, countries that took them for refuge. And, but what is also essential to say is that the Nazis did not have interest to destroy archives or, or artwork, Masonic artwork. I mean, they destroyed the Jewish synagogues because they wanted to wipe them out of, the, of, of a city's face. But b uh, before they did so, in most cases, they looted all the, the ritual objects and brought them to Prague because after the, after the war, that would have, that they thought would be victorious for them. They wanted to open a muse museum of an extinguished race. You see in Prague that there was a big center for all this, this Judaica. And they wanted the same thing to do maybe uh, with, with, with uh, Masonic objects. So, and uh, yes, at least I think it has, has fact, to, they did. to be clear. They, they, they did, in fact, uh, open museums, uh, opened, as was mentioned yes, in the paper. Yes. They opened some museums. But one last thing, as, you, as the, the paper also mentions, Reinhard Heydrich, I think that also the SS, they knew very well that the that Freemasonry all over the world was not a political um, danger for, for their regime. Not, they realized it quite easily, and it was not, of course, but they used it in their propaganda. You see, in the propaganda against the Soviet Union, they used the term uh, Jewish Bolshevist, and in the, in the propaganda against the West, uh, like you had Churchill and Roosevelt, they used a Jewish Masonic, you know, just as a propaganda phrase, but, 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 but the high-ranking officials they knew that they had nothing to fear. Thank you for all of that. I can understand the antagonism against Jews. That's gone on for 1,500 years. From your point of view, why were the Nazis so antagonistic to Freemasons? Uh, well, you see, uh, it all goes back to World War I, because, uh, I mean, the, the German nationalist um, forces, uh, they started the war, and then at the end they had the big problem, because they had to explain why they lost the war. Uh, Germany was diminished, it didn't enlarge, it was even even smaller than before. And then there was this, this book, uh, we all know it, The Protocols of the Elders of Zion. In the original Russian version, um, Freemasons are mentioned maybe once or twice. Uh, the German version came out in 1919 in, a, in an edition, you know, it was very expensive to print in this time, immediately after the war. And there, there you have the full attack against the Freemasons. I mean, there, there are new uh, subtitles and uh, the, the power of the Masonic lodges, the, the, the Jewish Masonic world conspiracy and so on. They needed a scapegoat for, 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 for losing World War I. And so, and, and they had the, the, the trials, the communists, the Jews, and then the Freemasons, but the Freemason, Freemasons to a much smaller part in the other twos. Thank you very much for that uh, intervention. It points out that uh, anti-Masonry is a very, very interesting topic mm. uh, because it has a long history of ideas uh, dating back to the Catholic persecutions uh, and, the, uh, and the discourse after the French Revolution and then the protocols and the Taxil affair and the First World War kicking in. And, but, and, I mean, needless to say, uh, any anti-masonry um, will turn up in um, extreme ideologies and in totalitarian states, and that's a good measuring point. So, very valuable discussion. Um, yeah, but please, we have a couple of minutes left before you uh, possibly want to switch auditoriums. Thank you. Uh 
I enjoyed all of these papers very much, uh, but I particularly wanted to ask about the Copiala manuscript. Sure. Uh, that presentation really uh, uh, blew my mind, as we say in American, uh, and uh, it raised a lot of questions for me, but uh, the matter of Jacobitism and Freemasonry is very interesting to me and something I've been trying to work on myself. And as someone who works on, on, on the German-speaking countries and Northern Europe, I wanted to ask, is, it, it, did, did that come to your mind because you've seen involvement or interest in the Jacobite cause in, in that region, in Germany, Denmark, in whatever area that manuscript might have come from? Or would that have, uh, do you see, basically, do you see any other evidence outside of the manuscript itself that people in that time and place were aware of Jacobitism, interested in it, might have been somehow supporting it? Um, <clears throat> yes. Uh, and I think we have to distinguish Jacobitism as, as, as the political agenda of restoring the Jacobite uh, s b pretendant to the British throne, and Jacobitism as some kind of intellectual uh, pro-Scottish movement or something like that. And when it comes to the first, the political goal of, of kicking out the Hanoverians from the British throne, there were quite a lot of rulers in both Germany and, and Scandinavia that, that were interested to kick out the Hanoverians. Um, Sweden was interested for many reasons. Revenge for that the Hanoverians had taken German territory from them after the Great Nordic War, uh, and so on, and close ties to France. Um, so, but but the, the the strange thing is that uh, when you read the history about the establishment of Scottish degrees, it is always said, well, this happened to to um, uh, to further the cause of the Pretender and the and the Jacobite rebellion, and there's no evidence for that at all. Rather, to the contrary, it's quite absurd because Berlin at the time of 1742 was not seeking an alliance with, with France and was coming to terms with the Hanoverian rule in Britain. Uh, in fact, uh, Prussia turned up to be uh, an, an ally to, to England later on in the huge power play in, 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 in in the 18th century. So that does not make sense. Why would Berlin suddenly become the hub of spreading anti-Jacobite uh, or pro-Jacobite uh, uh, propaganda and even uh, you know, raising money and forces to, to help to further the Jacobite cause? Um, but the existence of this particular document here proves that for the first time we can can say that um, uh, that there exists and some evidence. We don't know if it was practiced or if it's just a uh, matter of imagination. Uh, a link between linking political philosophy that is directed against a, a tyrant and a righteous cause uh, to 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 violently uh, um, uh, retake your own natural liberty, plus a very strong Christian message. And uh, where does that come from? What does it mean? And then it is obvious that I made this connection to, to that form of Jacobitism that is number two, so the more ideological course. Mm -hmm. Where did you say the translation of the Copiala was going to be published, or when? Um, well, we have not uh, decided yet when the, uh, when the translation is published. Uh, it's also uh, it's, it's, it's a, <laughs> a project that will involve several scholars, because I'm not an expert on rituals, and I want to have our finest uh, experts on rituals uh, having a look at the uh, craft rituals to, to make a, a clear uh, analysis of uh, of the origin of some of the motives that are exposed. Um, so the first thing is to do to produce a clean German copy of, of it. And that is what we are working on right now. And, and then the next phase to produce a full English translation and then to produce a commentary. But let's say within one year or something like that. Mm -hmm. Any editors around who are interested? <laughs> See you, Mm -hmm. 
I, I was interested uh, in the anti-masonry uh, uh, link uh, of um, this manuscript. Uh, what is your proof that uh, there is a real anti-masonic uh, tradition? Isn't it an hermetic use of uh, uh, masonry? And uh, I would, uh, would be glad to, to, to understand uh, the, uh, your evaluation, evaluation of uh, these two directions. Yes. You mean the anti-masonry in the Copiala? Yes. Well, uh, the, it, uh, I would say that right from the beginning, British Freemasonry had to battle anti-masonry in various forms. But organized anti-masonry, uh, 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 that means uh, an organization that organized similarly as Freemasonry and attacking it, that the first proof of that would be the Order of the Gormagans, I would say. Um, and, and then, uh, for some reason, in the 1730s, when Freemasonry starts to spread, uh, and, and the early 1740s, we find in the Pietist territories of Germany, in Denmark, that was very Pietist at the time, in Greifswald, which was under Swedish rule, where there was a conflict between Lutheran Orthodoxy and Pietism, organizations and orders popping up that were anti-Masonic, and they were mixed gender. And and all of them were attacking the fact that um, that Freemasonry was gender exclusive, for instance, and that it, uh, that it's it's, it's uh, in the Copiola. There's a long, long, long description of why Freemasonry is bad for people. So come and join us instead. That's what I meant with this: a kind of Trojan horse operation that you recruit people to uh, um, a biker gang to fight uh, the bandidos, something like that. <laughs> Well, if there are not more questions around, uh, this gives you a perfect seven-minute break to make up your minds of what you want to do and maybe to get some refreshments and to switch um, uh, auditoriums. And we have a session uh, um, on the evolution of fraternal metaphors, uh, on the French sources of the Scottish degrees in the Grand Auditorium, and Masonic biography here. And, and at 4.30, the closing plenary session. Thank you so much.